we're looking at the first six verses of the seventh chapter of Romans. Do you know what a metaphor is? A metaphor is when you're talking about one thing and you compare it to another to make a point. And you make a mistake if you pay too much attention to the metaphor itself and its meaning. Perhaps one of the most famous metaphors in all English literature is when an English poet wrote these words. No man is an island. Now, do you get the meaning of that? You'll miss the meaning if you pay too much attention to an island. If you hear, no man is an island, and you say, oh yes, I know what an island is, and you begin thinking of islands and where they are and what makes up an island, and you spend all your time thinking about that, you've missed the meaning. The meaning of the metaphor is that no person can live in isolation. All right, here's another metaphor. Actually, it's a simile. They say it's a simile if you use the word like. Some of you are familiar with this one. Like sand through the hourglass go the days of our lives. Like sand through the hourglass go the days of our lives. Now, there's a meaning there. But if you make the mistake, if you pay too much attention to an hourglass, to the point of the metaphor, you miss the meaning. That's not a metaphor about hourglasses and sand. It's a statement about how our lives just keep on moving. All right, I said all that to say this. If you read Romans the seventh chapter and you pay all your attention to what he's saying about marriage, you're missing the point about what he's saying about the Christian life. I agree with John MacArthur who says this about verses two and three. This passage has absolutely nothing to say about divorce and cannot be used as an argument to teach that divorce is never an option for any Christian and only the death of a spouse gives the right to remarry. In other words, Dr. MacArthur is saying, don't take verses two and three and say, well, that's what the Bible says about marriage. No, what the Bible's teaching us in this passage is what it means to be a Christian. Before a person is a Christian, they're married to the law. Once they come to Christ, they're in a relationship with him that can be compared to a marriage. Don't get so tied up in the metaphor that you miss the meaning. So let's talk about these two marriages. First, let's talk about our bad marriage to Mr. Law. Before you became a Christian, you're in a relationship with the law. And when I say the law, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the Ten Commandments, thou shalt. I'm talking about those thousands of other detail requirements in the Old Testament about what you can eat and what you can't eat and how you can get clean and how you're unclean and the days of the week and things like that. There's so many of them, and before you became a Christian, most people are bound up by the idea that God accepts me by what I do. I do good, I be good, and God accepts me. That's what it means to be married to the law. So let's talk about this marriage to the law and why it's such a bad marriage, it's such a bad deal. I want to tell you a couple things about old man law. Mr. Law says, all right, here's a list of things that you've got to do every single day. And here's the list of things you can't ever do. If you ever break one of these rules, buddy, I'm not going to forgive you. There's no excuse, no forgiveness. You just keep them. Mr. Law demands perfection. Now, remember, I'm not talking about marriage here, but ladies, wouldn't it be awful to be married to a man that all he ever did was make demands of you, give you a list of things you have to do today and a list of things you can't do today. And here's a list of what you have to do tomorrow. And here's a list of things you can't do tomorrow. And oh, by the way, it makes matters worse because he himself is perfect. Wouldn't that be terrible? Wouldn't it be terrible to be married to a man like that? Sure. That's what it means to be married to the law because the law is perfect. There's no fault with the law, but there's a demand. Be perfect. Here's the second reason this is a bad marriage. He condemns and never compliments. That's the nature of the law. The law always points out what you've done wrong, but never has time or energy to compliment when you do things right. Now, have you ever played a team sport competitively? I used to play basketball competitively, and the game was played with 12 men on the court. 
five on my team, five on the other team, and two referees. When the referee blew the whistle, he'd never point at me and say, 44, you're doing such a wonderful job guarding your man and not fouling, so I'm going to award you some bonus points for how well you're playing. No. When the referee blew the whistle and pointed at me, it was to tell me how I broke a rule, how I committed a foul or to take the ball away from me and give it to the other team because of a violation of a rule that I'd committed. I remember one game in college where I was called for three fouls in about 30 seconds. There was never a whistle, never a stoppage of play where the official would say, oh, you're doing a good job. The law always points out what you've done wrong, but never has the time or energy to compliment you when you do things right. Thank you, Lord for what you're teaching us about the relationship that you have for us. It's like a marriage relationship. And I pray, Lord, that we would strive to be in a relationship with you, understanding that there's mercy, there's grace, there's forgiveness, that that you have a better way, and that our old way that we're learning about and gonna continue to learn about it, it's just not something that's fun. It's a bad marriage. It's a bad relationship. It's a lose-lose situation. So open our eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts and minds to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Tell me I'm forgiven and free. Oh, I tried and tried to rectify my hopeless situation. But uh, by the lie, I still have work to do. But there is no condemnation